Hello friends, my name is uh, Lucas and myself and many friends of mine are out here today uh, as my brother mentioned earlier to bring to you the gospel of grace to bring to you the, the message of life the message of eternal life that Jesus Christ is Lord and that He Himself has come into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost and after my brother so eloquently shared the gospel truth with you all I seek to make known that same truth after him and then our brother after me and continuing on throughout the rest of the day by God's grace and friends we come out here to plead with you in light of the reality of Christ coming into the world that you would repent that you would turn from sin that you would turn from your sinful ways and you would turn unto God my brother mentioned that God says through the prophet Isaiah come let us reason together God invites sinner the sinners to reason together with Him. To have the gift of eternal life freely, without money and without cost. And that's contained in Isaiah 55. Our God is a gracious God. He is certainly holy and righteous and just, perfect in all His ways. We know that God has given His law, His Ten Commandments, which we have broken, which both you and I have transgressed. In fact, Paul says we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is, we, we fall so short of His perfect standard that we deserve hell. But Christ upon the cross bore the wrath of God on behalf of those whom the Father gave Him and rose again on the third day. And the promise of the Gospel is that if you will turn from your sin and embrace Christ on His terms, that you embrace the truth of the Gospel God has promised that your sins will be as white as snow. As Isaiah 1 says. That you will be forgiven of your iniquities. My friends, I've been forgiven. I'm a living testimony of the reality of the truth of God's Word. My brethren here today are living testimonies. Each of them individually and us corporately. Testimonies of God's saving grace. As even the hymn writer said, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. My friends, many of you are spiritually blinded. Many of you have been deceived by sin. Sin is deceitful. But in the end, it ultimately destroys. Sin kills, but Jesus saves. Sin damns souls. But Jesus Christ reverses the effect of the fall, the effect of sin amongst the children of Adam. He is the last Adam. He is the second Adam. He is the head of the church. Adam was the head of the human race and he fell in the garden and brought all mankind with him in his fall. But Jesus Christ is the head of the church and he represents all those who call upon his name in truth. And so we want to speak of Christ today. We are here to speak of the Lord Jesus Christ. To speak of the triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who saves His people for His glory by His grace. And so therefore, the passage of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to this morning is found in Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, in verse 19, verses 19 and verse 20. And the Apostle Paul is writing here about Abraham, Abraham's life. Abraham was an Old Testament figure who was known for his faith. And this is what he's talking about. Specifically, Abraham's walk of faith. And to give brief context, Abraham was given a promise that he would have a son in his old age. And so then, then Paul says this in verse 19. And Abraham and his wife Sarah had no children at this point. So you can imagine... How remarkable this promise that God gave to him was at the time. How extraordinary it was. It was out of the ordinary. Verse 19 reads, Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body. Now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith. And this last phrase is very significant. It says, giving glory to God. And that's what I want to make known this morning, to, to consider this morning is 
an aspect of saving faith. We know that we are called to have saving faith. We know that from Scripture. But one of the attributes of saving faith, one of the characteristics of saving faith is a God-glorifying faith. Is a God-glorifying faith. A faith that does not seek to bring glory unto man or unto the children of men, but rather seeks to glorify God. The God who saves by His grace and for His glory. It's important that we give God glory, my friends, for He has made all things to that end. We know that Jesus talks about the Father preparing praise for Himself in the mouth of infants. We know that Jesus talks about God being able to raise up rocks to give His name glory. We know that the Psalms speak of the heavens declaring the glory of God. Psalm 115.1 Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to Your name give glory. And then it says, because of your loving kindness and because of your truth. That's why God created this world to His glory. And so when we consider the Gospel message and our need for faith in that message, faith in that Christ, which that message speaks about, the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to realize that saving faith, this faith that we ought to have in the Gospel, needs to be a faith that is God-centered and God-focused. Our lives need to be God-centered and God-focused. In fact, many of you are living to the end, that is, the end of pleasuring yourself, bringing joy to yourself. But my friends, we ought not even live to that end. We ought to live for God. We were created to worship. And what has sin done? Sin has fractured the Imago Dei, has fractured the image of God in man. And man has become totally depraved and now he no longer worships God but himself and sin and the things of the world. But when someone is born again, that is changed. They are born a second time. They are changed by God's grace and they no longer want to worship those things. They worship the living God. They worship in spirit and in truth because God has enabled them to do that. He enables me to do all sorts of things. Sir, you need to be born again. God needs to enable you by His grace to look to His Son in saving faith. Amen. And so speaking of that second birth, of being born again, that is absolutely necessary for every one of you. That's why you must call upon the name of the Lord and ask for mercy. God is a merciful God. He is holy. He has holy wrath against sin. We know that the Psalms say God is angry with the wicked every day. God hates sin. And people say, yeah, we know God hates sin. God hates evil. But the Scripture says He even has hatred for the wicked. Hatred for evildoers. He has anger toward those who are ungodly and toward those who have rebelled against Him. For God has shown common grace toward mankind, even toward the wicked, to an extent. So that they have many reasons, abundant reasons, to give Him glory and to praise His name, to bless the Lord. We ought to say like the psalmist has said, Bless the Lord, O my soul. We ought to bless God for the great things He has done to ascribe unto Him glory. See, my friends, many of you are lost, do not have the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore God sees you as covered in your sin, as covered in the, the filthy garments of your iniquities, and you need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You need the righteousness that Christ, through His life of obedience, procured. Christ, through His life of submission to the will of God, procured a righteousness that is so pleasing to God that it will obtain heaven for those who put their trust in it. Those who look to Christ receive this righteousness by His grace and are justified. That is, that they are forgiven. They are absolved of their guilt. Not because God compromises on His justice, but because God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, fulfilled the law, fulfilled God's law on our behalf.
But going back to what I was saying, Abraham, this man, he placed his faith in God. And what do we know from the book of Genesis? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. One of the attributes of Abraham's faith in God, which God granted to him by His grace, was that this faith glorified God. It not only focused and believed in God, but sought to give Him glory. And so should we. So should that be our disposition of heart. To want to give God glory in thought, in word, in deed. In fact, the old hymn puts it this way, Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory. Great things He has done. We can glorify God, my friends, by coming yeah, to Him through Jesus Christ. Sir, you need to be saved from your sins. As I mentioned earlier, the context of this verse, Paul is writing this. And in the greater context, in Romans 4, Paul is discussing saving faith. I just quoted it earlier. He says in verse 3 of the chapter, For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's taken out of Genesis 15, 6. He starts the chapter out by saying, Abraham, this man of faith, was not saved by works of the law. Where Nobody can be saved by religious activity. Nobody can be saved by trying to keep God's law. Nobody can be saved by being a, quote, good person. And Abraham is the chief example of that. He was saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And Abraham, though he looked to Christ from afar, still believed upon Him. Jesus said, Abraham longed to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. This patriarch of the Old Testament saw Jesus' day and rejoiced. Rejoiced in the Lord his God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and worshipped Him from afar. So that's the context of this verse. So let's consider what I just read there in verse 19. Concerning a God-glorifying faith, it says, Without becoming weak in faith, He contemplated His own body. And that's true. That's how we ought to be. Because the world in which we live is filled with people and with ideologies, ideologies that seek to discredit the Christian worldview, that seek to discredit the Bible, the Word of God. And my friends, we ought to place our faith in the solid rock of God's Word, the infallible Scripture, Old and New Testament, these 66 books are given by inspiration of God and are profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. We ought to follow after Abraham's example. He says, without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body. Now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. And the deadness of Sarah's womb. So he looks around after receiving this promise from God and sees the hopelessness of the situation. Due to his age and the fact that he and his wife, even when they were younger, were infertile, they could not have children. But what does verse 20 say? Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith. He realized this, that God, when God makes a promise, He sees to it that that promise is fulfilled. And my friends, God has made a promise in the Gospel message. It's like, that it, any sinner who comes to Jesus Christ in faith, He promises to receive them unto Himself and to forgive them of their sins and to justify them, to bring them safely into His kingdom. Many of you are wandering about in this world, indulging in drunkenness and sexual immorality, addicted to pornography and setting before your eyes things which God detests, and listening to music that grieves God, that does not honor God. Many of you are wandering about in your lostness, and the days of your life pass by, counting down to the day in which you will die and stand before God. 
And my friends, we know that many of you are headed for destruction, headed for a place called hell. Infield is where we're headed. Now, my friends, we want you instead to go to heaven. We want you to be saved. We want you to be saved from God's holy wrath. See, God is not like we think Him to be. Many people perceive God as a cosmic genie in a bottle or a cosmic grandpa who just points down from heaven upon everybody and just zaps blessings over their lives. But my friends, God is holy. We know that the angels in heaven themselves are looking upon God and they are saying, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. We know that Isaiah, who was a holy man himself, when he saw God's glory in Isaiah 6, that he said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst the people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So also should we fear the Lord. We need to have a healthy fear. We need to have a reverential fear of God. You know, I fear fire. I'm not going to go walk into a bonfire. Because I'm, I'm scared of fire. I don't want to get burned by fire. My friend, Scripture says that God is a consuming fire. God is a consuming fire. We need to have a reverential fear of God. That we not dare set our hands to sin against the Lord of grace. Because we know that He is just. He is just. That He brings upon those who break His law punitive punishment. But He keeps loving kindness for those who love His Son. He showers them with blessings. There will be showers of blessings for those who believe upon Christ because He Himself was made poor that we might be made rich in faith. And therefore we ought to give Him glory as Abraham did. We ought to give Jesus Christ the one true God glory. And He is nothing short of God. Many people think of Christ as, oh, He was a great teacher, or He was a prophet. We know the Muslims believe that Christ was merely a prophet. Or Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Christ was actually Michael the Archangel. There's many beliefs concerning Jesus, but Jesus said seven times in the book of John, I am, I am, I am. Jesus came saying, Ego a me, I am. And that echoes back to the Old Testament, where God appeared to the Mo or excuse me, appeared to, to Moses in the flaming bush and said, I am. Jesus is saying, I'm the God of the Old Testament. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God whom they worship. And therefore he has the right and the authority to call us to do whatsoever He pleases. And therefore we ought to be diligent to see to it that we have repented and placed our faith in Him for eternal life. And then that last phrase as I just said earlier in verse 20 says, giving glory to God. Abraham recognized this, that his life was apart from God meaningless and apart from God worthless. But he realized that God had made all things for His glory and had set apart Abraham as father of the Jewish race for a specific purpose. To ultimately one day, through His seed, who is Christ, to bless the nations. And so Abraham, receiving this promise from God that he would have a son in his old age, that he would be a father of many nations, he gave glory to God. And it's interesting, the way this is written would seem to convey to us that it was as if Abraham was already praising God and already worshiping God for something that had yet to happen. Because he knew that God's promises are so sure, it's as if they had already happened. It's as if they had already become fulfilled. So it is with those who trust in Christ, my friends. There is a confidence if you trust in Jesus Christ for your eternal life, for your eternal security. There is an assurance that comes with placing one's faith in Christ. 
because God will see to it that His promises are upheld and fulfilled to the uttermost. So that we can say with the psalmist, the Lord is my helper, what will mere man do to me? So we would do well to ascribe to God the glory that is due to His holy name. We would do well to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. To live for a purpose that is extra nos, that is outside of us, outside of you and I. In fact, many of you, even in your sin, still desire to live for something that is outside of you. Perhaps you join the military to be a part of a cause that is beyond you. Or perhaps you get into sports because you want to be a part of a team. You want to be a part of something that is beyond you. There is a longing to an extent, even in the hearts of unbelievers, to live to something that is beyond them and as outside of them. My friends, to be a part of Christ's kingdom, to be an ambassador of Christ, to be a slave of Christ, to be a child of God, and to live to the end that He Himself would be glorified in your life is the greatest way to live the most joyful life that a man can live or a woman can live or a young boy or young girl can live is one that is lived for Christ. We say with great urgency, do not lose your soul for your sins. Jesus says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his only soul? Because it's only one. Once it is lost, it cannot be regained. My friends, use the time that you have now, today, at this appointed day, to seek the Lord. To seek the Lord while He is near. What does this, the text say in Acts 2.20? Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. There is no contingency. There is no possibility of failure with God's promises. All who call upon the name of Jesus Christ will be saved from their sins. And we need it for our sin will. It has already earned for us hell. When we are born, when we are in conception, we know the psalmist says that I was conceived in iniquity. My friends, we are conceived as sinners, as God-haters, as altogether evil and wretched. God bless you, sir. And in deserving God's wrath. Deserving of God's holy anger. That's why we must look outside of us for a Savior. Namely, Christ the Lord. What did the, what did the angel tell Joseph in Matthew chapter 1? One of the most precious passages in the New Testament. Right in the first chapter of the New Testament. Verse 21. The angel says, speaking of Mary, She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Or Yeshua, which is Yahweh saves in Hebrew. Name, he will call His name Jesus, for He will save His people from their sins. Yeshua means Yahweh saved. And so therefore, the angel says, Yeshua will save His people from their sins. Any Jewish people out here today? Are there any of our Jewish friends? My friends, I say Yeshua will save you from your sins. Yeshua is Hamashiach. He will save you from your sins. He is Messiah. And there is no other. In fact, study the Tanakh, study the Nabim. Go and see what Dawid wrote concerning Christ. That he would have a son. A descendant of his who would sit on his throne until God had made his enemies a footstool of his feet. And that's Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus the Christ. But the God of creation, the God of glory, who made the heaven and earth, heavens and earth, and all things therein, He made it good. The Baptist Catechism says that God made all things of nothing in the space of six days and all very good. God created this world originally as perfect, but sin fractured creation. Sin brought the fall. And, brought, and therefore brought destruction into the world and destruction to each of us, destruction of our souls, so that we inherit the guilt of our father Adam. 
Therefore, we need Christ. This God who made the world spoke and it was created. He spoke because He is all-powerful. He is omnipotent. He made all things by the word of His power. And He upholds them by the word of His power. God is so merciful that He would even create this world. He's self-sufficient. He's fulfilled within Himself. He didn't need us. He didn't need to make this world. He doesn't need to sustain it. But He did out of His good pleasure, out of His mercy, out of His grace. God is so loving that He would make you and I, that He would bestow upon us, as wicked as we are, the blessings that we have, the blessings that we experience day to day. That is love. That is an unconditional love. God even shows a measure of love, of love toward the wicked, toward the most evil people. I think about the evil dictator in North Korea, Kim Jong-un, and the evil things he does to his people, and how God in His common grace sustains him and gives him good health. That's incredible to think. That's the mercy of God. That shows the love, the grace, the compassion of God, the patience of God. God is patient with the wicked, not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. God is being patient with, the, with many people around the world because He has an elect group amongst them who will come to repentance in due time by His grace. And God is holy. God is holy, as I mentioned earlier in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah sees the, the heavenly vision, sees the angels pre, uh, praising God, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. My friends, that shows us that God is set apart. That's what holy means. Sanctified, set apart from that which is perverse and evil and wrong. God is righteous in all His ways, perfect in all His deeds. Psalm 119, 137. Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. We cannot, in our finite understanding, grasp how vast God is in the essence of His holiness. How great He is in His glory. And the word glory in Hebrew is kabod. And it means weightiness. There's a, there's a weightiness about God. That's why when we get up here, there's a, the way in which we speak, the inflection in our voices has a serious tone. Because these things aren't light. God is not light. The, the things of God are not light. They're, they're weighty. They're glorious. They, they have a kabod about them, a weightiness. And God is great in glory. So all creation shows us this weightiness of God. <laughs> How glorious He is. And He is triune. There is one God, but there are three eternal persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one God, the same in essence, equal in power and glory. There is but one only, the living and true God. There's not many gods. There's not a pantheon. As Hinduism would teach or other uh, Eastern religions, my friends, there is one God. One true God. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, He is one. And the triune God has existed eternally. Outside of time, in fact, before time was made, God was. And God exists in eternity. Outside of time, not bound by time. And this God gave His law on two tablets of stone in the Old Testament. Through Moses, through, through the covenant with Israel. He had set aside a nation unto Himself, the Jewish people, and gave them His statutes, gave them His law. The Ten Commandments, which is really the, the foundation of Western society. It's interesting. America and Western society as a whole, why has it historically been so blessed, so prosperous? 
because it was founded upon Judeo-Christian values. It was founded upon the Ten Commandments and things of the like. It was founded upon a Christian work ethic. And the Christian work ethic is, if you don't work, you don't eat. And therefore, therefore Western society has been greatly blessed. See, God's law was potent and powerful. And my friends, God's law is there as a mirror to show us our sin and show us that we need a Savior. My friends, you need a Savior. Sir, you need a Savior from your sins. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Uh, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sir, you need a Savior from your sin. You need to confess your sin. Confess it unto God and Christ Jesus says He will forgive all sin. Even the most vile sins have, that, which have been committed in secret. The blood of Jesus Christ is able to cleanse. But if you reject His mercy, if you trample underfoot the blood of Christ, then there only remains the wrath of God for you. A fearful expectation of the wrath of God which will consume His adversaries, which will consume His enemies. But going back to what I was saying, God gave the law. One of His commands was, He says, You shall not commit idolatry. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not lie or steal. Or dishonor your parents. Ask yourself. Look into the mirror of God's law. Hold yourself accountable to the truth. For God will on the day of judgment. My friends, look now this day and see that you've sinned. And see that you need Christ to redeem you. Riches, sir, in the money suit. Riches will not profit in the day of wrath. But righteousness delivers from death. My friends, money means nothing if we do not have the riches that Christ can give. Hell won't make you feel good, my friends. Hell, there's no party in hell. And it's interesting, I think some people say, I'm going to go to hell, and they almost are happy about it because they know, they think at least, that God won't be there. But my friends, it's not like Satan has a pitchfork poking somebody in the back. God is in hell. God is there punishing the wicked. God is there administering judgment. In the New Testament, it talks about the enemies of God being tormented in the presence of of the Lamb. Jesus Christ will see to it that His enemies are punished. That His enemies receive the just penalty for having broken His law and having offended Him. God's law shows us His character. Shows us His standard. Shows us what He says is right and wrong. And that's really reality. Woe to them who call evil good and good evil. Woe to our nation, our society, which calls things like homosexuality good. And things like marriage and having children to be a burden and a curse. When it's the exact opposite. Those things sin, like homosexuality, that is not a good thing. That is an abomination to God. That's sin. And the things which our society calls evil and a burden and a curse are actually a blessing. That's in the fifth race. Mary, marriage and childbearing, those things are a blessing from God. See, my friends, we need to realize that we have transgressed God's law. That we need forgiveness of our sin. That we cannot go off what we think to be right. In fact, the Bible talks about in the Old Testament a time in which every man did what was right in his own eyes. And how horrible that was for the nation of Israel. How there was, there was really destruction throughout their land. There was a tear, a rip in the very fabric of society when people said, we will do as we see fit. Sir, are you born again? Are you saved by God's grace? You need to trust in Jesus Christ. Crier on Jesus. You need to believe in Jesus. So God's law, our breaking of it, liars, thieves, adulterers, not only outwardly but inwardly. Jesus said, you look with lust, you're an adulterer, you have hatred in your heart, you're a murderer. God sees the heart, He sees the mind, He sees the intent of the heart, and He weighs it according to His law, and we are found wanting. You and I, my friends, are deserving of hell. 
just as a murderer who has transgressed the law of the land, a murderer who has, who has gone outside the bounds of the law and has killed someone else unjustly, deserves to be punished. We would all agree on that. We would all agree that the Parkland shooter, for example, or the shooter that recently back in, uh, in November, I think it was, uh, shooting up the, te uh, the, the church in Texas, uh, these men deserve to be punished. But when it comes to us, we say, oh no, I'm good. I'm a good person. My friends, according to God's law, we are not good. We are not. No, sir. No, is, no one is good. That's why you need Jesus Christ. That's why I need Jesus Christ. We can tell ourselves and we can assure ourselves, I'm a good person. My conscience, even though it tells me I've sinned and I've broken God's law, it's testified. And it's constantly testifying concerning my sinning against the Holy One. I'm going to continue on suppressing that truth. My friends, we ought not suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We ought not suppress our consciences which nag at us and remind us constantly of our sin against God. Rather, we ought to turn from that sin and turn unto God in saving faith. Turn to Jesus Christ in saving faith. Glorify Him in thought, word, and deed because He's worthy. Because He's worthy. So we deserve to go to hell. We deserve to be cast into the lake of fire. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46 that these, speaking of the evil ones, will go away into eternal punishment. Hell never ends. It continues on and on and on for all eternity. It, it, it is continual. But my friends, God rich in mercy and in accordance with His justice and His righteousness. It's not like God's attributes are at enmity with one another and they cancel one another out. They are in beautiful harmony. They are in wonderful harmony one with another. And my friends, God, before the world was made, was pleased to ordain that He would save a people to Himself. But God bless you, sir. God bless you. Killing got another RBI. Shed His blood. He, only for His people, sir. That's why you have to embrace Christ. Because it's not for everybody. Jesus' work is exclusive. That's the infield? That's the infield. It says all of But God, before the world was made, chose to save an elect people, a remnant unto Himself. Uh, Paul says it this way in Ephesians 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. My friends, God was pleased to do this to enter into the covenant of redemption with His Son, to commission Him to come into space and to time to live a life of obedience and to die a death for His people. And Jesus did so out of love. When the right time came, Jesus was born of a virgin to save sinners. He's born under the law. Paul says it this way in Galatians 4.4 4, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Jesus lived a life of obedience and submission to God's will. God's Ten Commandments. He never lied, he never stole, he never, he never blasphemed God's name, he never was a drunkard, he never looked with lust, he never committed sexual immorality. Jesus lived a perfect life, and my friends, we need to trust in that life to save us. Not this life, not the life you and I have lived, we've fallen short. We need to trust in Christ's perfect obedience. We need to trust in Jesus Christ to save us from our sins. You, my friends, need to repent, to turn from sin and turn unto God. For God is merciful. God has promised to be merciful toward those who turn to Him in saving faith. 
don't want to carry any more shit. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. Do not suppress the truth in your unrighteousness, friends. Don't suppress the truth of God which you know, which has been built into you. God gave you a conscience. It's interesting, the word conscience, if you do an etym etymological study, uh, you'll see that it's two Latin words, con and science. And science in Latin means knowledge. With knowledge, and con, the prefix con means with. So God, literally conscience means with knowledge. With knowledge of what specifically? Of God's standard of morality and God's existence. There's no such thing as an atheist. I'm an a-atheist. I'm double negative. A-atheist. My friends, it's because every person is built by God with a conscience, with knowledge. And they know of God's existence So Jesus Christ came into the world and He lived a life of perfect obedience. Submitted to God's will, we know in Matthew 3 that the Father spoke audibly from heaven at the baptism of Christ and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus fulfilled the law of God. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. And he did so to fulfill all righteousness so that he might give sinners that very righteousness of his own. And then he died upon the cross. He died upon the cross of Calvary. Cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani. That is my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? And then when he died, he said, Tetelestai, that is, it is finished. Upon the cross, he bore the wrath of God against sin. That's what Jesus' death on the cross means. It's not just that some bad guys nailed Jesus to a Roman cross and he was made a public mockery something more was happening at the cross and it was this that the wrath of God was being unleashed upon the Son of God the innocent one he who knew no sin was made sin on behalf of sinners he was rich emptied his account that we might be made rich in faith Isaiah 53 says, Surely our griefs He Himself bore and our sorrows He carried. And this is written seven centuries before Jesus was born. It says, verse 5, But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him and by His scourging we are healed. My friends, look to this God. Nahum 1.7 says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows those who take refuge in Him. Take refuge in the Lord, my friends, for His wrath. You will not be spared from His wrath. You will not be spared from God's judgment if you do not take refuge in the Lord Christ. In the Lord Jesus Christ. Sir, have you taken refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ? What is this? I'm an atheist. There's no such thing as an atheist. No such thing as an atheist. I'm an A-atheist, sir. I'll, I'll one-up you. I'm an A-atheist. I'll put it like this. I don't have church out here. Well, sir, you don't need church. You need Christ. Please leave me alone. Thank you. You can disengage from the conversation. But, sir, you don't need church. You need Jesus Christ. See, we don't need to start performing religious works or go see a priest or go do penance. We need to see the great high priest. We need to see Jesus Christ. We need to see Jesus Christ and to see Him in all His glory, lifted high. But my friends, Christ Jesus died upon the cross and when He died, the wrath of God was satisfied. In fact, the, the word that's used in the New Testament is propitiation. Pro, 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 the word propitiation means wrath has been absorbed. It means to appease. It means to appease God's wrath. And that's what Christ did in His death upon the cross. And then the Father vindicated Him by raising Him up on the third day. Christ, by His own power, rose Himself up from the grave. The grave is empty. Jesus is alive. Mohammed, He's dead. Buddha is dead. Gandhi is dead. Marilyn Monroe is dead. Ma uh, Martin Luther King Jr. is dead. And one day many of us will be dead. 
But Jesus Christ is alive and remains alive and alive forevermore. He shall be. And the Scripture says He will never die again and death has no power over Him. He is the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, and the life. The very radiance of God's glory. The exact representation of His nature. He is the Lion of Judah. He is the Lamb of God. Slain from the foundation of the world. And worthy of all praise and honor and glory. My friends, do not continue in your pornography. Do not continue on in your drunkenness. Do not come here today and roll around in the mud and drink down iniquity like sin and drink down all that alcohol and put yourself in a drunken stupor suppressing that knowledge of God. Rather, my friends, be sober-minded. Think. We're, we're challenging you. We're pleading with you. Think. Think, my friends. Use the brain. Use that muscle God put in between your ears. And think. And you will find that God is true. Though every man be found a liar. So what God calls us to do is to repent. To repent, to turn from sin. Repentance and faith. Jesus said in Mark 1.15, Time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And God grants repentance and faith by His grace. It's not They're not things that we muster up within ourselves. But for those who repent, who turn from sin and turn to Christ, who look to Him and give Him glory as Abraham gave Him glory, as I just read out of Romans 4. Big guy, here you go. He got one for you. God will forgive them of all their sin. God has forgiven me of all my sin. Past, present, and future, that's the promise. And God will wrap them in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is... Because Christ was treated as if He was a sinner, His people can be treated as if they are as righteous as He was. Because He fulfilled all righteousness for them. He lived for us. He lived on behalf of His people. Jesus takes my sin and I receive His righteousness. Christ carries my iniquities to the cross and is punished, is damned. He drinks my hell for me and rises again on the third day and gives me His perfect righteousness that I might be seen by God as perfect in His sight, all by His grace, not by my works, not by my effort, not by my performance, but by God's mercy, by God's grace. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Paul says it this way in Titus 2.11. He says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave Himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession, zealous for good deeds. It's all by grace, my friends. All by God's unmerited favor. Not by works of the law. Not by deeds which we have done in righteousness, but by grace. Grace, grace, grace. And it is to, his, to God's glory. We are saved that we might glorify God by our saving faith. In fact, it glorifies God for someone to place their faith in Jesus Christ because their salvation is no longer contingent upon what they may do or think but upon Christ's finished work. See, Jesus is a jealous Lord, jealous for His own glory. Is this it? And so it is all by His grace. No, right? All by His work. In fact, you could say we are saved by works. We are saved by religious performance, only it's not our own. The works by which we are saved are the works of Christ. The religious performance by which we are saved is the religious performance of Christ Jesus. We are saved that way. We are saved by grace through faith to God's glory, to that end. And so as Paul says in Romans 11, from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. And how true that is. Amen. My friends, 
You who are lost, you, sir, are you lost? Do you know Christ? I do. You need to turn to Jesus Christ if you do not know Him. My friends, if you know not the love of Christ, sir, you need to come to Christ and be saved from your sin. Yes. And He is a gracious Lord. He has promised to redeem those who comes to Him. And the Scripture says also, God will not be mocked. God will not be mocked, friend. And dear friends, we call you that because we call you our friends, not because we may know you, but because we care for you. We come out here because we care for you. I wouldn't stand out here and look like a fool in public if I didn't care for you. I want you to know the truth. I want you to know the man of truth. Jesus Christ is the Lord, and there is no other. He is God, and there is no other God but the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God whom we serve, and He is the God who saves and redeems. But He's also a holy God, and He will judge His enemies. In fact, the book of Nahum says, whatever you devise against the Lord, He will make a complete end of it. In other words, God will not allow you to set yourself up against Him and to rebel against Him. He will see to it that you're punished. That's why you need salvation from sin. So if you know not Christ, I encourage you to embrace Him. If you say that you are a Christian, I encourage you to examine yourself to see whether you're a hypocrite. If you are, I exhort you to turn to Christ to be saved. If you are a believer, if you are a Christian, I exhort you, brethren, to meditate upon the Gospel, to preach it, to proclaim it, to publish it all around, family and friend, friends alike, and even strangers. So to conclude, uh, what we've seen here in Romans 4, Romans 4, 19 and 20, that Abraham had a faith which glorified God. We've seen that God is holy and we are sinners. We're like worms. We deserve hell, but God was gracious in sending His Son. And all who embrace Him on His terms, all who deny themselves and take up their crosses daily and come after Christ, are saved by His grace and for His glory. And so as Abraham gave glory to God, so do we give glory to God, so do I give glory to God now. We're not worthy of glory. You're not worthy of glory. No man is worthy of the glory. Not the Pope. No religious leader. But Christ. Jesus Christ, the King. He is worthy of glory. And so to Him, and to the Father, and to the Son, to the one true triune God, be glory, praise, and honor forevermore. Amen.